Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar of State of Public Education and Privatization. Uh, we're going to begin with a land acknowledgement. These are always a little bit interesting when we're online. Uh, so I ask you to join me in, in honoring the territory that I'm on here in Pickering, Ontario, uh, which is the territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat peoples. However, I do invite you after this call to please do look up the resource native-land.ca. It's a really great website and you can actually search your area and learn what territories you're residing on. Uh, it's important that our work extends beyond what we do with our organizations to be a part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, and amidst ongoing systemic violences faced by Indigenous as well as Black peoples, um, it's essential that we centralize the fight for a just society within our personal lives. And this is a variety of frameworks in which you can get involved. Uh, you can do things like share uh, resources on your social medias, have difficult conversations with loved ones in your lives. Uh, you can support local businesses. And if you have the financial means, please do also consider donating. So welcome again. Uh, we hope to discuss issues today arising from decades of underfunding, increasing costs of accessing post-secondary education, challenges to academic freedom, and the influence that corporate donors have on post-secondary campuses. Uh, I'm going to get right into introductions so that we can get ahead with our panelists. Uh, so our first panelist today is Aliyah Kareem. She's a labor researcher and PhD candidate at the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. She was a coordinator of the Fight for 15 and Fairness campaign at York, which pushes back against precarious work on campuses and in the broader community. In addition, Aaliyah was the president in the York University Graduate Students Association for the past two years. Our second panelist is Erica Shaker, and she is the director of the National Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives National Office, or the CCPA, as well as the editor of Our Schools and Ourselves. Prior to becoming office director, Erica was the CCPA's director of education and outreach, where she monitored the privatization and corporatization across the sector, education finance, fundraising, community engagement, and social justice education and equity. And our third panelist is Ian Zekanovsky, who is a professor in the Department of Human Resources and Organizational Behavior at the Ted Rogers School of Management here at Ryerson University. Ian has been a faculty member at Ryerson since 1991, served on the negotiating committee of the Ryerson Faculty Association since 1994, and acted as chair of the committee for four rounds of collective agreement negotiations. Ian has also served as chair of the collective bargaining committee of the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations, also known as OCUFA. Uh, and since May 2020, Ian has been serving as president of the Ryerson Faculty Association. So hello again, my name is Nicole Brianis, uh, and I'm excited to be here with you today. Uh, I'll be hosting on behalf of CSER. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was previously the president at CSER last year, so I'm really excited to be back. Uh, and this year, I'm the National Deputy Chairperson for the Canadian Federation of Students. Uh, so a little shout out to all of our collaborators today. Uh, so first off is the Continuing Education Students Association of Ryerson, or CSER, uh, who represents over 16,000 students registered in continuing education, distance education, off-campus, and part-time degree courses at Ryerson, uh, and is Local 105 of the Canadian Federation of Students. We also have the Ryerson Faculty Association, who is the certified bargaining unit for tenure-track faculty, limited term faculty, librarians, and counselors at Ryerson University. And we also have the Jack Layton Chair at Ryerson University who promotes progressive social change and strengthening political capacity at Ryerson University. The newly formed Ryerson Graduate Students Union who supports Ryerson's graduate students through their academic pursuits, program specific initiatives and host networking events. And finally, the Canadian Federation of Students, who is the largest uh, student organization in Canada. Uh, we represent more than 530,000 students across the country with more than with 62 student unions. Uh, and we also represent domestic and international students uh, in the college, undergraduate and graduate levels, as well as full and part time students. So just a quick logistical note, uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, please write them in the chat box uh, and we'll try to answer them at the end. Uh, if you're posting about the discussion tonight, you can use the hashtag uh, education for number four, all. Awesome. 
Uh, so before we jump right into the panelists' questions, uh, I just wanted to give a quick oversight about the difference between publicly funded and publicly assisted education systems. So publicly funded systems is um, the idea that, you know, this is something that the Canadian Federation of Students currently advocates for and unites our members in lobbying. Uh, and this is the idea that universal education uh, should be the main platform for post-secondary education. Uh, and this would allow for, uh, it's not free education, but it's publicly subsidized. Uh, so this means that despite what students' financial backgrounds are, everybody would be able to access without financial limitations. We also have, um, you know, this was something that did exist in Canada post-World War II. However, over the years, we should have shifted to a model that is uh, publicly assisted rather than publicly funded. So publicly assisted means that there's been a continual withdrawal of public funding over the years. Uh, and this has led to things like skyrocketing tuition rates, using international students for cash cows to pick up the tab, and decreased quality uh, or skewed funding for research. So with all that being said, uh, I'm going to pass things over to the panelists and we'll jump into our first question. Uh, and the first question is for Erica. So how has steady decreases in public funding for post-secondary education and in institutions pushed us away from viewing post-secondary education as a public service in the eyes of the government, post-secondary institutions in the public? And how have we gone from a publicly funded post-secondary system in Ontario to one that is publicly assisted? Well, thanks for um, inviting me tonight and also like to say hello and thank you also to my co-panelists. Um, Nicole, you actually summed it up. So I'm just going to repeat a little bit about what you said. The short answer is just the sort of unholy trinity of a combination of reductions in federal funding and how the funding mechanism was changed. Um, varying levels of provincial support, usually in the downward direction. Um, and increased reliance on private funding. And when I say private, I mean corporate funding for sure through sponsorships um, and other forms of donations, but also tuition fees, obviously, which are also a, a private source of funding. Other compulsory fees, uh, alumni donations, um, and just sort of this, this, this real shift in where the money is coming from and the implications that, that, uh, that take place as a result. So governments are the largest single source of funding for post-secondary education, but it's actually less than half. Um, and the federal component is a lot smaller uh, than what it used to be. And it's uh, much smaller than actually what comes through the provinces. As a percentage of GDP, uh, the federal government's cash transfer for post-secondary education has declined significantly since the early 90s, and certainly since the mid 90s, when of course we had the sort of watershed budget, Paul Martin's you know, slaying the deficit budget. Um, the federal government hasn't gotten out of post-secondary education altogether. I mean, they still are, are somewhat invested or quite invested actually in, in research, um, but significantly in other areas, the federal focus has really shifted um, from funding the system uh, to direct funding for individuals through grants, through loans, the government portion proportion of uh, RESPs and through tax expenditures. So it's, con it's much more on an individualized basis. Um, as federal involvement has declined, uh, so too has largely, the, and, and actually almost universally now, uh, provincial support as a proportion of total funding over the past few years. But the difference has to be made up somehow. Uh, so provinces have chosen to download the costs onto students and their families in varying amounts. In Ontario, of course, students pay a significant part of their education in uh, user and tuition fees. And then of course, uh, international tuition fees have just soared as institutions have pursued full deregulation um, for, you know, it, yeah, I mean, to compensate for just the very mediocre uh, provincial government initiatives to try and limit annual tuition fee increases for domestic students. So they're still going up for domestic students. There's sort of a, a predictability to that, but, um, but, but they've just pursued full deregulation for international students to, even, to compensate even more. Um, so it is very fair to say, as one VP of finance did at one Ontario university um, over a decade ago, probably close to two decades ago, so I'm really dating myself, that universities are essentially uh, private institutions that receive some public assistance. Um, that's not untrue, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, it doesn't negate the, the public investment in that infrastructure. That infrastructure is still, is still there. So there's still, you know, there's still ostensibly public institutions, but it does change things fairly significantly. 
and it introduces all sorts of dynamics when it comes to equity or transparency or accountability. Um, we really saw this when uh, executive MBA programs started in the provinces and corporate executives were being charged really hefty fees for these degrees for the privilege of attending these sort of CEO finishing schools. Um, and as, as some, you know, as, as some professors said, it's really hard to fail someone who paid $40,000 to take the course. So, you know, it really, that sort of customer is always right mentality is really infiltrating um, how we think about public education. You know, what are you paying for? Are you paying for the education? I mean, and the whole concept of paying, of course, is problematic too, because whether you pay publicly or you pay, pay privately, we're still paying for it. It's just, you know, it really changes the relationship and I think the level of expectation. Um, but the, the customer is always right mantra has really infiltrated um, how we think about education as well. And it's very dangerous. Um, and I'll just make another quick point because I know the other speakers have great stuff to say too. But what's really interesting about insufficient public funding is how susceptible it can make um, so-called public institutions to the influence of those who wield the, the power of the pocketbook. Um, I'm talking about alumni, wealthy alumni, wealthy donors, individuals, corporations. And I would put increasingly the influence of future employers in that category too. So this is, we really saw this with the discussion of performance indicators, increasingly tying even public funding to the requirements of the job market. Um, and of course, you know, all these changes are taking place within a, a broader ideological framework um, that paints public funding and the commons as inherently wasteful or not cost effective. Um, and this is where the whole sort of return on investment argument comes in, which is useful to a point, but ultimately it's really indicative of, I think, sort of capitulating to these really narrow economic parameters that recognize the price of everything but the value of nothing when it comes to um, post-secondary education. And of course, there's you know, tremendous value in a society that recognizes the importance of well-rounded, engaged citizens with access to a wide range of subjects who are not deeply indebted <laughs> upon graduation. Um, and blamed for, you know, daring to study something that merely, you know, they were passionate about um, rather than taking a risk on what the job market might want um, and might pay highly for four years from now, which is, of course, such a crapshoot. And we saw how that just did not work out in Alberta, but the mantra still is maintained. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Erica. I think you touched on all the main points. <laughs> Uh, the, the idea about, you know, funding uh, a system rather than funding an individual, which we've shifted to is, I think, very, uh, it's a very important point to hit on and uh, for folks to understand and that uh, it's become so isolating and that's why we see uh, so many issues for being able to access it and why we see such the ability for increased tuition rates because for so long now tuition has been so high that students don't recognize that it shouldn't be this way like this is not right, uh, and there needs to be power in the collective to fight back against that. Um, I also really appreciate that you touched on the strategic mandate agreement uh, that's been shifted by the government, the performance space reviews that the government will be uh, requiring institutions to comply to in order to access public funding. Uh, and this is really dangerous for many of the humanities and social science programs that aren't as, um, you know, um, you can't measure them as well as you could measure something like business or something uh, like finances. And this is going to hold a, a very troubling and a very scary reality uh, for many of the programs that uh, aren't being valued or not showing value from the government and where they want to see the job markets go. A hundred percent. And it's such a gendered uh, problem as well, right? Because I mean, we're talking about, I mean, you, you we're in a position where because childcare, for example, is compensated at such a low rate, somehow there's the sense that it contributes less to society than, I don't know, um, you know, a bank, <laughs> bankers or, or architects, right? But I mean, it's all that, that's such a gender dynamic in and of itself, what we value, how we choose to value it, and then how we choose to determine whether or not that education is valuable and, and whether or not people should actually be allowed to pursue that passion when it's something that we so rely on as a society, like caring professions, right? So no, you're, you're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, and I'm excited to hear more from you in a little bit. Uh, for now, we'll, we'll go on to Aaliyah. Uh, and Aaliyah, the question is, you know, some members might identify tuition fees increasing uh, as a direct correlation with faculty salaries increasing. Um, so what can we do to combat these divide and conquer strategies? And uh, what, can we, what can be done to show unity between university staff, faculty, and students? Well, thanks also for having me tonight. I'm really happy to be on this panel. Um, you know, that is a, a tough question. And like we can see 
that there's um, divide and conquer strategies all over campus, right? Like whether that's trying to divide students and faculty, uh, faculty and staff, and also staff and students. Um, you know, I think that in any of these situations, um, when it comes to the university or college administration trying to divide the university community, really the only way to fight back is through um, building cross campus alliances. So I want to talk a bit about what we've done at York in that regard. Um, you know, I can go on and on about uh, how our university, just like others have, you know, cozied up to the private sector, the, you know, uh, naked corporatization on campus. It, it has, it's, you know, really frustrating and, and definitely plays into how the university administration tries to divide us, right? Um, but I do want to focus on like, how can we push back? You know, these are really overwhelming issues, right? So one thing that we've done in the last few years and, you know, through my time at the Graduate Students Union is um, basically form a cross campus alliance and have um, one representative from each of the, you know, faculty, there was well, like one faculty union, um, but, you know, staff unions uh, representing um, office workers, food service workers, custodial workers on campus. Uh, we have a few students unions because York is so, you know, we have like undergrad, graduate, uh, same at Ryerson, right? So there's multiple uh, student groups. Um, and, you know, basically we reignited the group a few years ago. It was active um, even before that, especially when, you know, we're known for having our sprites at York, right? So uh, we have, you know, come together to support each other uh, during strikes. Um, when I was there, we tried to meet at least once a month. Um, again, just like simply with at least like one representative from each of these either unions or, you know, non-unionized groups, um, but most of us are represented through unions, right? So we tried to just get one representative from each group uh, to come together and, you know, talk about uh, bargaining. If people, if, uh, you know, their respective unions are going through bargaining or having some issues with the university administration, um, we would talk about, you know, common issues, of course, like for all of us, like public transit was a huge issue in the last year. York, uh, you know, woo, we got our subway. We're really happy about that. But we've had issues with, uh, you know, busing, getting, uh, well, having the bus uh, drop off students, staff, and faculty on campus was so something that affected us all, right? Um, so we come together, you know, quickly uh, give each other updates on that. And that's, I think, a way to build like common understanding um, and just, you know, contact between each other, right? It's actually a challenge, I think, with so many different groups to like just, try to meet once a month, like that's just the goal, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just uh, try to uh, be organized and stick to some kind of routine. But you know, those meetings I think we've, we've had are crucial, again, to, you know, tell each other like bargaining is not going well, you know, we might have a vote coming up or go on strike at a certain, you know, point in time or having this specific issue with the administration. Um, we really planned a response all together when our uh, food service workers employed by Airmark went on strike a few years ago. And, um, you know, I think the, we call it the CCA for short. I think that group was really crucial to uh, really like raise noise on campus about what those, you know, these are like low paid, often racialized um, immigrant women who are in food services. And we know like the vast corporatization of food services on our campuses, right? So, um, you know, by coming together, we are not only able to write letters and plan rallies, you know, across campus to make noise about that and especially to support those workers on the picket lines. Um, but we were able to, you know, plan strategic things like in that case with food service workers, um, we wanted to have a boycott of Airmark the food service provider. So faculty, like, you know, we had one representative from a faculty association who talked to their union about canceling contracts uh, for catering services with Aramark, right? So, and that really pissed them off, like, like really, really badly. But that was a way to show like, hey, we as a community support these workers, you know, you should bargain fairly. And um, because of that support, like they won a very, very huge, they're very successful in that strike. They won higher wages, um, you know, the same benefit coverage for part-time and full-time workers. Um, and they were facing a lot of um, racism, like actually 
Aramark employers and managers on campus like dividing workers trying to like um, you know basically have uh, workers of the same race or background in one food outlet and you know kind of yeah, I guess make them compete against each other or you know divide them that way um, so we talked a lot about you know the racism that they face in the workplace so um, you know I think the CCA was very very crucial there and um, that's really the way to push back whenever the administration is trying to divide us. It's not always easy like of course in the case that um, you know you're you're bringing up like you know tuition is, is a hot topic like you know because of that drastic um, uh, drastic fall in the funding to universities and colleges. Like we do see, of course, like tuition going up and uh, we do have to question like, where is that going to? Like, yeah, part of it is faculty salaries for sure, but I'm sure a huge chunk of it is going, it has gone to bloated, you know, university administration salaries. And um, yeah, I don't know, things that are questionable on our campuses, I'll say. Um, you know, we have huge reliance on private donations at York, of course. So those are things that we talk about in the CCA for sure. And try to just, again, like gain common understanding between groups. But, um, you know, yeah, we, we've had moments where I think certain groups disagree. Um, all you can really do is like try your best to bring people together, you know, talk it out if you can. And, you um, you know, I think we've been really successful with like shared letters to the administration whenever, uh, you know, we have criticized the corporatization, private donations, um, increase in tuition, but also like presidential searches. And um, I think the administration has been like surprised when um, we've, you know, sent those letters or made statements as a CCA, right? Um, it's, yeah, on a, such a big campus, it's not always easy to uh, get us together. Um, but also through, I'll, I'll just mention uh, briefly, like I was on the Senate at York University um, through the CCA, like I was able to meet, you know, faculty and staff who are also on the Senate. And I think there, like, you know, we were able to, again, like focus on shared issues and, and really like break the silence in Senate. Um, you know, I don't know about your experience at Ryerson, but, um, you know, for York, I think the, the you know, university administration likes us to be divided, they like us to be silent. And in those Senate meetings, um, they're mostly talking about academic policy, right? But they just want us to not say anything and just pass, like, you know, have your votes and that be it, right? But I think through the CCA and just like identifying who our allies are, um, we've been able to really break that silence in those meetings. And yeah, we can't just like, you know, change the, how the university is run, um, you know, uh, it's, it's going to take a lot of work, right? But I think those spaces where uh, we are intervening, where, you know, making statements, um, you know, through students unions, faculty unions, and staff. Um, I think that's been pretty powerful and very um, unexpected for the university to see that pushback through spaces like that. And in my time at York, you know, that grew to, you know, paying attention to the Board of Governors then because they make huge financial decisions. So uh, we put a lot of work into like, communication communicating with our you know student representative on the board of governors and then you know pushing people um allies and, and those people we think would be good for you know running for those positions right so i just think that uh that work you know very much came out of our cross-campus alliance and that's led to like a whole like network on campus where you know we know where our allies are we can resist um you know the university administration so um that's yeah been my experience and um it, yeah again it, like it's not always easy to um you know, say at Ryerson, if you're looking to start a cross-campus alliance, um, it's not always easy to start, but if you just build contacts with a few unions and go from there, um, you know, it, it can be a really great thing. That's what I would recommend to push back against universities and colleges. Wow, thank you so much, Aaliyah. Uh, I think that the message that you're drilling home is definitely an important one and strength in numbers is the key to any type of success. And I know a lot of folks look to York, especially the unions at York, uh, for motivation about how to approach situations and how to unite across campuses. Um, Ian, I trust is gonna, I think, touch on one of the issues that 
the Campus Coalition at Ryerson is working on right now. Um, but I know that from my experience last year, uh, as well as, um, you know, when the OSAP cuts were first announced last year, um, students took to walkouts and uh, having things like a campus coalition was so helpful in achieving academic amnesty or encouragement for students to be able to walk out of their classes and have such successful actions. Uh, so as well as from a labor perspective in terms of, you know, support during bargaining uh, and support during strikes, which is so important. Students also receive that support too by uh, those types of initiatives, uh, and I think that across the board, it's such a beneficial, uh, bene beneficial factor, uh, and definitely a strong alliance that does need to exist across campuses. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so we can go on to Ian, uh, who is uh, the question for you is, you know, profiting off of international students education is one of the ways universities compensate for government cuts. Uh, so Ryerson University is now the third Canadian university to sign a contract with the privatized pathway system Navitas. Um, so does this partnership demonstrate the growing dre uh, trend towards privatization of public universities? Before, before I, I, I sort of feed into Navitas, I think I, I just want to provide some of the Ryerson trajectory. It, it is, a, Erica says, it's really a private, in, it's become a private institution with, with public funding. Of the 800 million plus in the Ryerson consolidated budget, um, the government provides, I think, just clear of 300 million, and uh, and and student fees and 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 uh, provide provide more than that, and then there's other sources. So really, the government uh, grants, oper operating grants, have become, you could probably say, a, a minority source of of, of um, Ryerson's revenue, and uh, other changes have occurred as well. Um, the uh, Ryerson has, has grown. I think around two, the year 2000, we had about 13,000 students. Now we've, we were in excess of 40,000 students. And uh, our faculty hasn't grown that much. Um, it, ha it has actually grown from now from about 700 to 900. And uh, the student yield has, has grown immensely. We have uh, <clears throat> far more students for the number of faculty and also per government grant than we ever had before and the students themselves are paying more. So the students are actually the source of, of, of Ryerson's uh, growth and possible uh, well-being. And uh, <clears throat> it's something like, a, a, it's become something of a student mill. And they're very concerned about their yield per student. And uh, also students have become concerned about the yield per tuition dollar and such like. So it's become a yield model and it's, and. Uh, which is very consistent with, with, with corporate thinking. And, and, and uh, <clears throat> it's very much top of people's mind is how, what is the yield based on the revenue that we're getting and how do we survive and how can we generate more money? So student, and students are increasingly carrying the can. But also the funding model has changed. Ryerson used to, Ryerson used to get uh, a, a funding per student and now the, student, the funding formula has changed and it's, it's, a, it's a type of envelope system. And Ryerson is no longer getting funded per student growth in a direct fashion. So if we take in more students, we won't necessarily get, get more government grants. We get student tuition, but it doesn't pay as much. And then the government last year did cut uh, the, student, the tu student tuition by, by 10%, which represented a, a, a probably 3 to 5% reduction in, 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 uh, in Ryerson's revenue. And... Uh, this actually put a bit of a, 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 a span in the work. So Ryerson have been growing students to make money and uh, it actually funding formula changed and that, that, that strategy was being threatened. And then the government cut the tuition somewhat as far as, and that put a further dent in, in, in the plan. So the, the Ryerson model was now, now being challenged somewhat. And uh, that's when Ryerson turned consciously and deliberately to uh, international students. And the Ryerson international student uh, proportion was somewhere below 7%, which is much lower than most universities in the province. And a decision was made to increase that to 15% and then later on move it up to 22, 23%, which is more in keeping with some of the other universities. And the national students are paying three to four times as much and some universities five times as much. So this was going to um, <clears throat> generate the revenue for Iceland, they weren't getting, they couldn't get any more because they couldn't grow quite as much. And also that because local domestic tuition had been cut. And so the move towards uh, international students was purely and simply a revenue drive. And uh, now we move to Navitas and uh, Navitas is a well-developed recruitment operation. 
as reported in very many different centers around the world, and it's expensive to recruit. And so Ryerson reckoned that um, it was more efficient to have Navitas recruit and bring them into Ryerson in the and, 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 and in a sense, educate them for the first year, paying considerably high fees, I think it's excess of 30,000, I'm told, and uh, now they pay these fees to Navitas. Navitas would pay a portion of that onto Ryerson. Navitas would pay Ryerson, this is the model at Ryerson, as a cost of some of the instruction. And then in the second year, or, or maybe it would take 18 months, Ryerson would uh, transfer, uh, sorry, Navitas would transfer these students into Ryerson in the second year of a program uh, under some type of articulation agreement with Navitas. And uh, then Ryerson would continue to receive the full, the same tuition rates for the next three or four years of the student's career. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a total part. Oh, and Navitas, of course, is, is, is a private company owned by some private uh, uh, individuals. And I think, uh, is it uh, um, some pension funds? I think it's three or five pension funds. And it's a complete, it's a private organization. And, and, and Ryerson is entering into partnership with this organization to deliver students in their second year into Ryerson. And Navitas will, will, will benefit from the, from the revenues from the first year. And Ryerson will take it over in the second year and uh, continue, continue to receive whatever fees these students generate. So it's, it's, it's nothing but a partnership with a private organization. Students are going to come, if, 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 if this plays out, paying hugely inflated fees compared to regular Ryerson students. Um, it's unclear what sort of learning experience they'll have. Um, Navitas will recruit them and bring them in, provide supports. Um, but they're not going to be taught by regular Ryerson members, the faculty members, and they're not going to be registered in regular Ryerson courses, and they're not going to be Ryerson students. This has been made quite clear. Um, Ryerson will indirectly provide the instructors because, and, and they will come from Ryerson's most precarious, disposable and flexible workforce, which is a CUPE union, Canadian union of public employees, and uh, they get they get hired on a course by course basis with virtually no benefits and 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 very little continuity of employment. If not, and they get paid as a student. They don't teach. They don't earn. And they have very little bargaining power. And they're not part of the Ryerson academic uh, community as such. And the courses that they're going to teach um, will be derivatives, I think, of some Ryerson courses. But their academic oversight will be quite tenuous. And they and uh, um, they're going to be run through our school of our Chang School of Continuing Education. Um, it's uh, suggested some rice and faculty may be paid to oversee some of these courses, but they won't be within the bosom of any academic department. And uh, and the other important thing of this is that that Navitas will be recruiting students who would not otherwise be admission will gain admission to rice. As it's input to us, they won't necessarily have the language skills, they won't have the necessary course credits, <clears throat> so they wouldn't gain admission through any other recruitment channel, such as Ryerson might offer itself. And uh, so these are students that, that are somewhat wanting in terms of their um, qualifications for first year at Ryerson, and they're going to recruit them, and they're going to train them or educate them for a year, and then deliver them to the second year of a program, claiming that they're going to have a, a GPA of some, somewhere around three, which I think is in around 70%, 75%. So they're taking less than qualified students, students that wouldn't gain admission, charging them quite a lot of money to be taught by faculty members that are not part of whatever rigor comes with the particular academic department. So in an area where you would think they would need more academic rigor and they claim to provide intensive support from the academic side, there's probably and most likely very little academic rigor and then claiming to deliver them into a second year at some point as, um, as superior students. And it's unclear how they're going to do this. Um, when asked why regular faculty couldn't teach this as part of our regular university structures, we were told that uh, Navitas insisted that it be taught outside of the mainstream. And it was a negotiation with Navitas. And when you negotiate, you have to make compromises. Um, when asked what sort of supports it is that Navitas will provide, our university said that that was sent up to Navitas. And, the, and Navitas has proprietary intellectual, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what you call IT, information technology, and they couldn't really divulge what they were doing. So there seems to be some smoke and mirrors here, but Navitas is a private organization 
will be recruiting students and delivering them to Ryerson at a later date. Ryerson will then benefit from the ongoing fees of those students and Navitas will benefit from them in, in the first year. Um, and so the question was, how is this partnership demonstrative of the growing trend towards privatization of universities? Well, it's, it's, it's quite clear. It's, it's, a, it's a complete privatization. Private organization recruits, provides services, and then and makes money out of it. And, 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 and students pay a lot of money for this and delivers them to Ryerson at the end of, at the end of the, that um, pathway period. So I, I think that, that explains it. It's entirely revenue driven. Ryerson wanted to increase its international uptake, intake, and it approached Navitas uh, as a way of doing this. And um, I, th I think, I, I don't know if that's enough of an answer to the question, but, but it's just simply a private exercise. And, and local Ryerson students probably won't get the same services. And, 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 uh, <clears throat> and it's, it's questioned actually how they'll be treated and, and, and if they're given the same step up that Navitas is proposing to give its students. Yeah, amazing, Ian. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. And I think that gives a really sound background to the Navitas programs. And uh, I remember last year when I was at Ryerson, you know, this kind of got snuck in there uh, and folks didn't really know what was going on. And that seems to be the narrative across campuses is that this organization now is approaching universities and it's not well known, known in Canada. So the dangers of it are not well, uh, you know, kind of highlighted in advance. Uh, but the more that we learn, the more that we see that it is a, a danger for students as well as for um, workers on campus. Uh, and, you know, I had the opportunity to speak with um, folks in Manitoba because one of the schools that Navitas is currently partnered with is the University of Manitoba. Uh, and some of the sentiments that have been expressed there by students is that they didn't understand when they were being recruited by this program in their home countries that by participating with Navitas, they would not be members of the university. Um, they didn't understand that when they came, uh, they're expl explicitly excluded from representation with student unions on campus. Uh, so they don't actually have any support mechanisms. Uh, Navitas creates a, a total isolation for these students on their campuses uh, and in ensuring that they receive the highest profitability they take advantage of the lowest paid labor as well as ensure that there's no benefits, there's no chance of tenure, there's no chance of increase in wages the more hours that you teach. Uh, so overall, it's just a very dangerous deal and something that um, you know folks need to be very aware of. Uh, if there are pathways already, pathway systems already existing on your campuses, these are things to look into because again, sometimes it's that mentality that they're already there. So people don't even understand uh, the, the challenges and the dangers that they bring with them. Uh, but when you hear new programs trying to be introduced to university, uh, it's the time for students and labor to really join together and fight off these uh, hazardous uh, privatized programs that will take advantage uh, in every way that they can.